G'day, I'm Paul. So we have reviewed the Sangyong Musso already, but there is now a facelift. There it is right there. And I have some more exciting news. It looks like Sangyong has actually been bought out now. So the previous videos we've shot on these, I've told you to just take it easy until we find out what's happening with the company because they declared bankruptcy. Well, it looks like they now have a buyer and that means that you can buy with confidence knowing that the company will still exist. This right here is the top specification Musso XLV ultimate with the luxury pack so it's priced at just under forty-three thousand dollars before you add on the three thousand dollar luxury pack this competes with things like the mitsubishi triton the ldv t60 and the great wall motors canon and if this is too expensive the whole range kicks off at just under thirty-five thousand dollars today we're going to do a detailed review of this car so if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of the review you can use the time codes up on the screen there or if you're on youtube you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. That way you'll find out every single time we tell you about cars that have been saved from bankruptcy. Now let's talk exterior. So you've got six external colors to pick from and all but white are $495 extra. Now, what about this design? So you can see here the facelifted section is this whole front. So it's got a much bigger grill now. It looks like the big SUV version uh, that they sell. The rest of it is kind of the same though. The headlights look pretty similar. Um, in terms of the design of that grill, so it's a big open space there for cooling, but then the sides here are all blocked off. The finish has this sort of uh, 3D effect on it and then it gets dark as you head down with the radar module down the bottom. Now, I apologize for the car being very dirty. One of my colleagues got it stuck this morning, so that was before we filmed. Anyway, um, over on the side here, headlights. So they still haven't upgraded these headlights, so they still use Bizen, and it's one of the few cars on the market that has this ancient headlight technology. Um, but, I don't know, hopefully they will at some point upgrade to LED headlights as well. Fog light down the bottom there, and then we'll whip around the sort of side. You've got a set of 18-inch alloy wheels. So this has a piano black finish on it. Decent amount of profile on that rubber, but if you are going to do any sort of off-roading, this is pretty much a highway terrain tyre. You'll want to get some chunkier off-road tyres. A bit of wheel arch protection there as well. It is worth noting as well that the XLV, which is the one that we're looking at here, is 300 millimetres longer and comes with an extra 250 litres of payload. Um, the entry level to the XLV range is leaf sprung, so you get that extra payload capacity as well, whereas this here, the Ultimate, retains the coil springs. So that means you are taking a slight hit there in terms of payload. So if you do want to sacrifice some luxuries, but need the payload, you're gonna to have to go to the entry level of the range. Now up the top here, we've got a camera built into the side here, an indicator in that wing mirror. No side steps, so it's fairly bare down the side. And it's pretty disappointing to see just this plastic uh, grab handle here on the side, especially on the top spec model. I would have thought this would be body colored or, or at least be a nicer finish than that sort of scratchy plastic. Come around to the back, being the long wheelbase, let me show you what that means. So that means you're getting 1600 mil of load length, 1100 mil between the wheel arches and around 570 millimeters of load depth. It also translates to a payload of almost 900 kilos. In the tray, you've got these hooks off to the sides, but there is no 12 volt outlet or anything sort of too fancy. There is no torsion bar here, which means the tray is pretty heavy to close. Well, heavy if you're a KFC loving weakling like I am. Over here you've got incandescent globes, no LED, which is a great shame. Musso, you get 4x4 there to indicate that it is the 4x4 model. And then Sangyong lettering. Finally, you have a 3,500 kilogram brake towing capacity. Now tell me in the comment section, are you excited that Sangyong has found a buyer and that everything has now been saved? Let me know what you think down there. So we're inside the Musso. Let's start off with the key. Here it is. So you have lock, unlock, panic on the back there you've got the sangyong logo and watch this flip out key i like that um this is a proximity sensing key so in your pocket grab the door handle and then once you're inside you have a stop start button um okay so what about the presentation of this i think it just looks nice and then when you actually have a look at it a little closer you can see why they've kind of coined this the ultimate and the luxury and that type of thing so you've got these soft touch materials along the top there Look at this, you've got like this perforated leatherette material here with exposed stitching 
and then this faux carbon set up along the uh, the top of the dashboard there. It's just nicely presented, it's minimalist, it doesn't really do anything too crazy. And uh, for the price that you're paying for this, this feels a whole lot more premium than what you're getting in some of the competitors. Even down to like the screen ahead of the driver there and the seats themselves with those perforations for the cooled seats. I think it's a cool setup. Okay, so touch points over here. That is softish, but firm when you push in a little further. And then the door is the same sort of thing. How soft are they? Well, we've got our gyrometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you want to see how this car compares to others, have a look at the link in the description. And what about build quality? Feels not too bad. It's all fairly solid. And uh, the final thing we check is the doors. Let's have a listen to this. Sounds good, nice and meaty. Let's talk infotainment. So you have an eight inch infotainment system. I would have hoped that with the facelift of this car, in addition to the LED headlights, they would have changed the infotainment system because it is pretty dated. It doesn't really feel cutting edge and it is very basic. So in terms of the features, you have AM and FM radio. It goes through a six speaker sound system. Sound system is okay, not really that sort of crash hot. So if you do like your music, you're probably not gonna to be too uh, blown away by it. Uh, but you do get uh, smartphone integration, which means you can do, and because it's a Korean car, it's gonna keep coming up with that message. Um, you do get uh, the ability to send music through the infotainment system and also do your voice commands. So you get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both of those are wired. I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like. So full screen integration. Um, it's not the sharpest screen in the world. So you can see there, it's quite sort of pixelated. Uh, but it moves between the menus okay, it's just a tiny bit laggy. And this is what Android Auto looks like. So again, full screen integration, uh, slightly laggy as you sort of move between the, the different screens there, but it's okay. Uh, in addition to that, you can also just connect your phone over Bluetooth and that will do all of that work for you. Voice recognition button here as well for interacting with your phone. Now, ahead of the driver is a screen that gives you information on trip computer, plus a number of other menus. So I'll run through those quickly. You can see trip computer, you also have a digital speedo. And then inside those menus, you can also then flick through to other settings, other displays there for the digital speedometer, which I think is pretty cool, all your safety settings, radio, and also the compass heading as well. So nice little setup, discreet, but does the job nicely. The safety side of things is interesting. So you have autonomous emergency braking, you've got an auto dimming rear vision mirror, you have a lane departure warning and a lane keeping assistant, a blind spot monitor built into the wing mirror and rear cross traffic alert. But there is no ANCAP safety rating. So this car has never been crash tested, which is a little bit disappointing, but one of the other cars in the family that uh, shares parts with this, which is the big SUV, that has been crash tested and got five stars. So uh, I'm not saying that it does, but I would assume that this would then have a similar rating given the structure is fairly similar. Now, in terms of parking, you've got front and rear parking sensors and a 360 camera. Let's have a quick look at that. I'll show you what that looks like. Um, the camera's actually pretty good. So that is your rear view. It's then split screen with this top down view. But what you can do is flick between the screens. You've got the left hand side of the car there, the right hand side, and then the front. The only thing I don't like though is with the rear view, if I engage reverse here, it points to the ground. So instead of being able to see out towards the road and what's going on around you, it points to the ground and it's great for loading a trailer, but not great if you actually need to see what is up here in that cutoff region. Moving on to practicality down the bottom here in terms of your connectivity, you've got one USB port, one auxiliary outlet, and then two 12 volt outlets. Where are you gonna put your phone? Well, you've got a sort of pad down the front here that you can sort of rest your phone on but strangely it's got like a divider in it you can whip that out if you need to but weird setup uh, you can put your phone in the cup holders as well and what about your coffee cup well i don't know where it is so we're using this instead uh, that fits in nicely there and there's also teeth as well so your coffee isn't going to escape what about just a standard bottle well we've got our empty one here that goes into there pretty easily and then inside the driver's door that fits in very nicely Let's try our big one, we'll see if that goes into there. Perfect, that fits in great, so that is good news. Other storage, so center console here, nice and deep, big open space there too. You've got a glove box, which is pretty reasonably sized as well. Even if you put the manual in, there's still gonna be enough room to put other odds and ends in there. And then up the top here, you've got a holder for your sunnies. 
Okay, and what about your comfort features? So there's a fair bit going on here. It is worth keeping in mind that this car has the optional luxury pack. So it's an extra three grand, brings with it sunroof, uh, dual zone climate control, and Napa leather and a few other bits and pieces. So make sure you do your research on that first before you buy, just in case you want that as well. So you get dual zone climate control, which is controlled over here. You have heated and cooled seats for the front row. You have a heated steering wheel. Seats themselves have that Napa finish. They are electrically adjustable, so you can go forwards, backwards. You can move the backrest forwards, backwards. You can lift the front the back and you also have lumbar support as well. Seats themselves are really nice and comfy too, especially if you're doing long distance drives. The steering wheel has both tilt and reach adjustment. And then in terms of our reach test, easy, easy, lemon squeezy. Okay, back seat. Now, before I start talking about this, I don't love the fact that there's like a metal bit on the door that sticks out because when you're getting in and out, you kind of nudge yourself on that. So it's a Bit of a silly design but once you are back here you have a reasonable amount of knee room i would have expected more given how big this thing is but yeah my knees are sort of on the seat there toe room is okay uh, headroom is really good uh what other creature comforts have you got well you've got map pockets here you've got air vents to keep you nice and cool no device charging unfortunately but you do get a center armrest here with two cup holders Holds out bodily and okay, but because it doesn't have teeth, it kind of just flops around a bit. And then that can fit inside the door as well. You've also got heated seats for the two outboard seats as part of the luxury pack. Disappointingly, there's no storage behind the seats. Uh, you can kind of store stuff under here, but it's not exactly the most versatile space. Some utes actually have seats that fold out to give you a bit more sort of usability in this back space. Okay, so we're on the road in the Musso. Uh, outside of the facelift, there hasn't been any change to the engine, uh, but that's not such a bad thing. It's a 2.2 litre turbocharged four-cylinder diesel engine. Makes 133 kilowatts of power and 400 newton metres of torque, and that's all made it to a six-speed ASIN transmission. Look, it's not the most amount of torque in the world. 400 is now sort of well and truly behind the rest of the pack. We've got a lot of the other competitors that are at 500. Even the LDV T60 is at 500 newton meters of torque now. So I think they probably need to do a little bit of work there. And you can kind of feel it behind the wheel. It's not underpowered, but if you sink the boot in, you just sit around waiting for things to happen. It's not really the the quickest thing to get up and running, which is a little bit disappointing because the rest of the package isn't actually that bad. And the reason I say that is because the ride is is weird. It is really soft and cushy and comfortable. So they've done away with the leaf springs on the top spec of the XLV and the coil springs just do a really good job of just rounding everything out. It probably is on the softer, softer side, which means if you are doing a country road drive and you hit some of those continuous undulations, it will sort of buck about a little bit and it's not the most confidence inspiring thing but if you do need a comfortable ute that is comfortable when it doesn't have load in the back this really does sort of fit the bill. In terms of fuel economy Sangyong claims a combined average of 8.9 litres per 100 k's we are currently sitting on 9.6 so pretty close to that claimed figure. What about your drive modes well you've got three to choose from using this button here you can switch between winter, eco and power they're all such inspiring names, aren't they? Um, okay, so we're in power mode now. Let's give it a little punt through here. See how we go. It's got a fair bit of body roll, uh, but that only so much is to be expected. I was actually surprised by the steering feel. Um, it's actually not terrible. Like it's, it's light in terms of the feedback, but you can kind of feel what it's doing mid corner. So I think it's pretty impressive that a ute actually has some kind of steering feel to it when you're going around corners. And turning circle, 12.2 metres. It's actually not terrible for a four-wheel drive ute. It means you're going to be able to get away with doing U-turns in and around the city. And the steering at low speeds is super light as well. Given the size of this thing, that's going to be important for manoeuvring into tight parking spaces. I'll explain this in a bit more detail when we go off-road, but unlike some of the other utes in this segment that can drive on sealed surfaces in four-wheel drive high range, this can't. You've just got uh, too high. If you switch to four high, you're basically going to do damage to the to the drive line potentially if you drive it on a sealed surface but it does have a built-in air locker which acts as a rear differential lock so i'll run you through that uh, when we do go off-road but for on-road driving you can only drive in two-wheel drive sangyong doesn't have an official zero to 100 time but we put it up against our stopwatch and this is how it went
So what's visibility like? Well, it's, it's not really a commanding driving position. You don't sit up really high. And I think that's better because I don't know, I'm just sick of feeling like I'm sitting on top of the car. This is a good sort of middle ground. So I can see clearly down the fronts of the car there. I've got a blind spot monitor built into that wing mirror. The wing mirror is pretty big too. And visibility out the rear is excellent. That envelope is huge. And of course, when you are parking, you've got front and rear parking sensors as well. So it really has the whole kit and caboodle. The other really impressive thing here, I could almost whisper to you guys and you'd be able to hear me. It is dead silent in this cabin. The engine is really quiet but there is barely any road noise coming into here and it is just really nice and smooth. And I think that's exactly what you want. If you're gonna be clocking up a lot of miles and you need uh, you know, the ability to load um, stuff in the tray as well, like this is kind of that perfect compromise as a long distance hauler and something that's able to then tow and put, put actual things in the tray. So uh, I really do wish more utes were like this where they focused on the refinement just a little bit more than just outright power and torque. So let's do some light off-roading and I'll run you through some of the specs first. So you have in terms of uh, four-wheel drive modes, two high, four high and four low. So you've got a low range transfer case. Um, in terms of your approach and departure angles, approach angle is 25 degrees. That's the angle of the face you can approach before you hit anything at the front of the car. And 20 degrees is the departure angle, which is the same, but in reverse. Ground clearance comes in at 215 millimeters. And there is no differential lock. Well, no manual differential lock. There is an Eaton air locker, and I'll run you through how that works shortly. Uh, if none of that makes any sense, click up here to watch a video we uh, shot explaining four-wheel drive controls and how they all work and that kind of thing. I think you might find that useful. Um, so what we'll do first, we'll go into four high and we'll attack our cores here. Uh, it's pretty dry at the moment, so it should be straightforward. Let's see how we go. We'll do our climb here, and then with our descent, there's a hill descent control. I'll give that a crack too. The good thing about the ride being so gentle is that <laughs> Log Mountain is like a, a very nice massage on the way up. It's sort of getting up here without any dramas at all. I'm just leaning on the throttle and it's climbing. So despite the throttle having that sort of laggy feeling off the line, it actually gets along okay once you sort of stay stuck on it, which is pretty good. Okay, so let's engage our hill descent control. Have one push of that. It's come up saying hill descent control is on. We'll see how it fares. Whoa, that is going way too quick. That is way too fast. It's almost like it's not even working. There we go, it's okay once you start going down the hill a little bit, but yeah, I reckon that is, that is way too quick. It's sort of set to about five kilometers an hour. I can't make it slower or faster or anything like that. So um, yes, I would just <laughs> be doing the work on my own instead of letting it do that. Righto, let's head to our offset mogul. We're gonna do a flex test here to see how rigid the body is. But what I'll do is I'll leave this in too high for the moment, simply because I wanna show you how the Eaton air locker works. Uh, so we'll get to that in a second, I'll run you through it. Okay, so seesaw first. Uh, this feels like it's getting deeper every single time I come through here. I'm going to switch off parking sensors as well. Ooh, it's like stomach churning each time we come through. Okay, so getting to the center section here, we'll wait till we've got those two wheels in the air, which is there. Okay, so that's that's full flex. Uh, let's see how that goes. No dramas at all, so able to open and close the doors. Which is pretty impressive when you look at the wheelbase of this car, it is huge. So at this position here where we're flexing the body, in theory, it should actually, uh, it should really sort of, um, <laughs> not be able to close the doors. So pretty impressed with that. All right, let's run through here and we'll get to our offset mogul. And that's where I'm gonna be able to show you how the Eaton air locker works. So remember we're in two wheel drive here and I also have uh, stability control switched off. So as we approach here, we're gonna to get to the section where our rear tire is completely off the ground right now. I'm gonna roll off the brake and get onto the throttle and you'll be able to tell when it activates because it'll wait for there to be a difference in RPM between the left and right of the rear axle and then the diff lock will activate and I suspect it's gonna be pretty harsh. So there it is, <laughs> holy crap. It's literally like someone running up and shunting you in the back. So it is effective because it gets you out of there quickly, but I don't know, I'd like to just be able to switch it on myself instead of having to rely for it to come on. By that point, you're probably already stuck and it's too late anyway. Okay, let's do that once more. This time around, I am going to be in four wheel drive high range. Come on, parking sensors. And uh, I just want to see how it goes getting through here 
under its own devices with the traction control and whether it is effective enough to, to just get the car through when that wheel is off the ground. So here we go, we're approaching our section now. We'll set it up so that wheel's off the ground. There it is, just there. I'm gonna roll off the brake now and we'll see what happens. Here we go, feel that rear diff lock activate and it pulls us through without any dramas at all. So um, yeah, it's a good system. Uh, in four wheel drive, high range, it will do most of the work for you. I think if you found something really challenging though, you'd probably want to have a switch there for the rear diff lock to just make it, you know, get through easier and knowing that it is actually on instead of just waiting and hoping that it switches on on its own. So Sangyong Musso, they've finally found a buyer and that makes me a whole lot more confident about recommending this. At that price point, it is loaded with features. It even comes with stuff that I don't think you find on any other utes in this segment, like cooled seats in a work vehicle. It just makes perfect sense. So it's quiet, it rides beautifully, and it has plenty of room inside as well. It does all that stuff great. It is laid down though by an engine that doesn't have enough punch. I think 400 Newton meters in a vehicle this size just isn't enough, especially if you're gonna to be towing and putting stuff in the tray. But you do get the benefit of a really quiet interior and the engine is super quiet as well. So. Uh, Oh, and the other thing as well, I would love to see a button for the diff lock. I think that's the only other thing it's missing for off-road driving. So let me know in the comments section below, have you bought a Sangyong Musso? What's it like to live with? What's Sangyong like as a company to deal with? I'm keen for your feedback down there. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. Uh, but until next time, take it easy.